my learned colleague N.K. Premachandran in regretting that the uh, government has been abusing the legislative process, especially the ordinance route to push through its political agenda. For us as lawmakers, we have two prime tests to keep in mind while legislating. First, we must see whether a bill or an ordinance has enough merit to be enacted. Second, we must see whether the proper procedure and process has been adopted in order to meet the standards of procedural fairness. Analyzing the merits of a bill is distinct and separate from analyzing an ordinance due to this very reason, but you are obliging us to combine both and I will do so. It's very much possible for a bill to be labeled as welcome, while at the same time as an ordinance it is bad in law. Unfortunately, this nuance is often missing from our deliberations in Parliament. Now, I'm not saying we don't need ordinances, but the manner in which we exercise ordinance making is something we need to be conscious about, and cautious about as well. Even prior to the adoption of the Constitution, we had experienced the abuse of ordinances under the Government of India Act 1935, when the British Viceroy could promulgate ordinances whenever he felt it necessary, and the legislature could not maintain a check on him. That's why when Article 123 of the Constitution was framed, it had limited the powers of ordinance in order to prevent the growth of a legislative authority parallel to the Parliament. As per Article 123, an ordinance can only be promulgated once the President is satisfied that there exist emergency circumstances which render it necessary for immediate action. In fact, when this provision was being debated in the Constituent Assembly, members did raise the same fears of misuse that Premachandra and I have done today, and Dr. Ambedkar replied assuaging the fears of the members by saying the ordinance power can only be invoked when emergency situations, quote, suddenly and immediately arise, unquote, when the Parliament is not in session. Even one of the most important uh, senior members of this previous government, Sri Arun Jaitley, when he was leader of the opposition, said, and I quote, an ordinance under Article 123 is only issued when issues of extreme urgency arise and cannot await a forthcoming parliament session. The matter must be of such urgency between the date of issuance of the ordinance and the date of the parliament session that it is difficult to wait for that period. We need to ask ourselves as to whether we have met the constitutional standard required under Article 123. The Supreme Court had also clarified in the landmark R.C. Cooper case that while an ordinance may be in the name of the President, it is really an action of the executive. The courts, however, cannot inquire into the nature of the advice given by the Council of Ministers to the Prime Minister or to the President, and therefore it is our duty as MPs to ensure that the advice required or given to promulgate an ordinance is a sound one. Now, Dr. Ambedkar was optimistic in his hope that this parliament will act as a robust check on the executive. I'm sorry to say, sir, we have failed to do so, especially due to the lack of respect this government has and its predecessor government uh, has for this August House. I'm afraid the preamble to the ordinance fails to mention any cogent reason for this urgent emergency action. The Minister must give an explanation of the exact nature of the emergency which arose between the date of the ordinance, 2nd March, and the 17th June 2019, when our Parliament session commenced, for which an ordinance was emergently necessary. The materials relied upon to show that this situation was urgently, urgently required, and how it reached the threshold that Dr. Ambedkar had asked us to follow in the Constitution. The Minister must also list the steps taken in pursuance of this ordinance during the period. If the Prime Minister truly believes in the uh, idea that this Parliament is a temple of democracy, then he should explain the reasons before this House, rather than treating this House as a mere rubber stamp for the Government's political agenda. The ordinance process, as envisaged by our Founding Fathers and Mothers, was intended to enhance the constitutional process. I regret to note that instead the government is using these powers to bypass and subvert the constitutional process. Last week, we just took an oath, all of us, to serve, to protect, to defend the constitution of India. If we fail to insist on these constitutionally mandated procedures, then we will be failing in our oath to protect the constitution. Mr. Chairman, I would now like to turn my attention to the bill itself, since you are combining both. The Honourable Minister gave us a lengthy history of the idea of SEZs coming up during the Vajpayee era, etc., but he failed to mention that special economic zones receive statutory recognition only with the passing of the SEZ Act in 2005. 
You mentioned, you mentioned that that was when it started. Very good. Due to the economic vision of former Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh, I somehow missed that. But let me just say that old India should also start giving credit to new, uh, to new India should start giving credit to old India also, once in a while. He realized the need to have special zones with tax incentives. I don't think that, that for, instead of giving a tax, I wish the Honorable Member would have heard what I had said. Okay, okay, I, I, I genuinely missed that particular... I didn't hear the word Dr. Manmohan Singh, but if you said it, I'm very pleased. No, need not yet. Okay. Keep doing it. Keep uh, giving us credit. The about who the Prime Minister was. I gave credit to all of them. But if they do not want the credit and only want Dr. Manmohan Singh, I'm happy to say that Congress has no role in it. Only Dr. No, Manmohan Singh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Honestly, the Honorable Minister should, should really say things worthy of his, worthy of his stature. Uh, but, but, but do, our Prime Minister just told us how important it is to recognize the names of leaders who deserve credit. The Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh, uh, had an economic vision and he said that the idea was to have special economic zones with tax incentives to boost manufacturing, exports and generate employment. Unfortunately, we are yet to realize the vision of the SEZ Act of 2005 under the present government. It is disappointing to note that far, unsortly far from the target of creating 100 million new jobs, unemployment has now reached the highest rate in nearly 45 years. And during UPA 2, even when the world was suffering from recession, our exports increased by 126% under Dr. Manmohan Singh, but in the last five years, our exports have barely increased by 10%. In fact, in 2017, this government notified Parliament that half the land notified for SEZs are lying vacant. That's 45,711.64 hectares of land lying vacant, who have been notified for, which have been notified for SEZs. We have also been told by the government in answers to parliament questions, 150 SEZs are non-operational. Now, I would appreciate it if the minister can provide the parliament in his reply with the latest figures on how many SEZ units are, are lying vacant. The Minister could inform the House as to whether a comprehensive review of SEZs has been conducted. If so, what are the structural reforms which this Government will undertake to ensure the maximum utilization of SEZs? Honourable Minister, i sorry, I was addressing the question to you. Have you conducted a review and what structural reforms, what structural reforms will you undertake, sir? And if a review has not been undertaken, will you undertake one in a time-bound manner so we know on what basis this policy is advancing. We also know that some SEZs are stuck uh, due to litigation, cases stuck in court. We're all aware of how long it takes for our courts to dispose of cases pending before them. The delay of justice is truly a denial of justice, but we can't always blame the judges for the delays because they are extremely overburdened. Therefore, we need to boost funds allotted to the courts, help set up additional facilities, undertake judicial reforms, or create special courts in the SEZs before SEZs can truly become an effective tool for economic growth. Now, the question of the land being a state subject has been mentioned, but the centre can easily take the initiative to coordinate with states to frame uniform SEZ policies, to set up single window for clearances, and to facilitate the smooth inflow of investment and capital. The ruling party cannot shy away from this responsibility, given your large mandate in half the states of the country, and also Union Territories, of course, are directly under the central government, so there is nothing preventing you from actually initiating SEZs there. Now, your bill is no empowering the government to notify any entity as a person to be eligible for the benefits under the SEZ Act by amending Clause V of Section 2 of the SEZ Act 2005. Now, that means you want to include trusts, for example, under this definition under the bill, but can you give us examples of such entities or trusts which may have availed of this provision under the ordinance? Can you also give us other examples of the kinds of entities you have in mind who ought to be included in the definition of a person apart from those specified? See, the bill by delegating large powers to the government to notify who may qualify for benefits under the Act can also increase the misuse, the scope for misuse of the law to benefit select individuals, as Mr. Premachandran has alleged. As they say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, 
And while I don't doubt the Minister's good intentions, I would appreciate it if he can explain to us how and why the extent of legislative powers must be delegated to the executive and how it will not be misused. We've already heard accusations of land grab under the guise of SEZ activity. The SEZs do have the potential for being the driving engines of our economy at a time when we are underperforming as an economy. It's time for us to fulfill their potential. And I want to stress that, as I said, it is possible to disapprove an ordinance without disapproving of the bill that follows. My queries are raised in that spirit, Mr. Minister. I wish to stress that we in the Congress are proud of India's economic growth, and we will not stand in the way of anything that may help advance our country's economic growth. But I would urge the government to do the right thing in the right way. In other words, stop resorting to ordinances, bring bills to this Parliament's consideration and debate. Jay. Thank you.